the Lollygaggers podcast, we pride ourselves on providing wholesome, family-friendly entertainment. Sick and deranged families, but, you know, families. In this episode, Justin slays Black Ops zombies and listens to Reddit about Goblin Slayer, while Jeff continues Gideon Falls and gets sinful with the others. Both Lollygaggers then break down the 2018 iteration of Halloween before ending with the Gentleman's Challenge. Welcome to episode 30 of the Lollygaggers podcast, a show about all sorts of different geek things from comics to games, movies to television. I am one of your hosts, Jeff. Hello, I'm Justin. What's up, man? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm doing pretty well right now. Dodgers just clinched. They're in the going to the series, World Series. I'm happy. I'm happy. So I'm kind you? of the exact opposite. Yeah, uh, so it's at the same time. Uh, pretty yeah, much yeah. at the same time. Indians got wiped out first round. Um, <laughs> dude, phrasing. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, then my football team is one and eight, so that's good too. And then the Buckeyes just lost. So it's a pretty mm-hmm. good weekend so far. So, yeah. Cool. Cool. How'd rating go tonight? Did it go all right? Good. We uh, one shot everything except for the final one, two shot. So it's been very efficient. So hopefully we get to head start Mythic next week more. Okay. All right. I see you've been playing a different uh, different video game this week. Uh, I have been. with. Yeah, uh, you like that? You like that setup? That's pretty good setup. That's good. That's a good. That's what you call a you, transition. You just, you just put that okay. right in. Yeah, right. That's in the easy. Yeah. Uh, I've been playing uh, with our mutual uh, heterosexual life partner, uh, Gabriel. Uh, we've been playing some uh, Call of Duty Zombies. That's true. Um, Black Ops Four Call of Duty Zombies. I've never played a zombies before. Um, I've played one for maybe about like twelve seconds. I was like, this is just Killing Floor. So I don't know if I if I like this. Because I find Killing Floor sometimes to be repetitive and boring, even though you can say about about most games that are kind sure. of sure. Well, Killing Floor is pretty repetitive. I mean, you just yeah. you go to a certain point and you defend as everything kind of comes in, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. What it is, and like increasingly high numbers and and difficult uh, zombie creatures come at you, and, and it's your fun. friend. Uh, your friend Wally yeah. just wanders off and gets himself killed. <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go. Just take this melee weapon and just take them all out. And then uh, you see it on the screen. Uh, player has that. So uh, we started playing this. It was me, him, uh, Keith played, and Ruben played. So this is the main four that've been playing it quite a bit. And I've never done a zombie game before, but because we bought Call of Duty for the Black Ops. Wait, 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 wait. When you mean zombie game, you mean like specifically for Call of Duty because we played Left 4 Dead for no, like for the, Call of Duty zombies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So right. I've never played that. And we got it for Blackout. And I played some multiplayer with game. Multiplayer is not bad, but still just Call of Duty. So it's like the same thing as always. But um, now I've never played zombies and like I decided to start playing with them. And so it works a lot like Killing Floor. There's waves. However, what's different is, and this is the most uh, like, expanded it's ever been it's never been this detailed like i think the last one they were saying is okay but like this one's really detailed like there's a story and there's a progression through the levels so the way is it like a good story or is it just like tacked on it's okay story um but like what makes it interesting is the progression so basically there's there's four maps three of them are in the original game then one is through the DLC you get for the extended edition or whatever it is. So I don't care about that. We're just getting the first one. So the one we've been working on a lot is called uh, Blood of the Dead. It takes place in Alcatraz. So that's pretty cool. So basically. Sure, sure. Blood yeah. of the Dead. That, yeah. sounds, that sounds positive. And um, the four main characters, there's a Russian, there's an American, there's a, a, uh, a Japanese man. And they forget the last one. I think it's just another American. But like, are they the, actually from these places? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they are the most stereotypical you can be. Yeah, um, just, that's what I was going to ask. I'm like, how stereotype? It's like, is it pretty like rough. Russian uh, accents. So, yeah, okay. Uh, and the idea is you need to survive these waves of zombies. And when you survive them, you know, the higher you survive, the, the more points you get, whatever. But what makes it different is there's a little thing where you can unlock stuff to try and finish the level. And so there's like little clues and little like scavenger hunt things. For example, um, if you collect 
a, a ghost's essence, a warden's key, which is a big mob uh, in the game, a shield that's on the ground. I think that's it. If you put those all together, you then get a like a uh, a barricade shield with a key on it that works like a um, a Ghostbuster gun, and then you can kill the zombies and use their souls to charge things. And so basically you are progressing through the level. One of the biggest things that we found out recently was if you hold up your door, like your, uh, your shield to a certain area, three numbers show up. If you then go down to the lower levels of the whole facility and put these numbers into a machine and turn it on, a cage then drops. When that cage drops, uh, there's a skeleton gets picked up by a crane on the other side of the level you then have to throw an axe you find underground in lava to throw at this. So this is the, how complex this stuff is. And I don't understand. I haven't found, figured out any of them. I've just been along for the ride. I do not understand how they are catching these at all. Because, like, the most recent one was you get the spoon from the skeleton's hand. You then put the spoon in a bathtub. You kill things on the roof. The bathtub fills with blood. And the blood drains out. And then you have to pick up the spoon. It becomes a golden spoon. But we don't mm-hmm. know where the golden spoon's at. Obviously, right. these are all things that happen in normal life. So, right, sure, yeah, mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. very convoluted and really interesting because, like, now you're getting to the point where it's like you're kind of like leaving one or two zombies alive and letting them run around so you can keep on progressing through the level and game through this stuff. So it's all really, really interesting. Um, so I've really enjoyed it, um, especially with the guys who play because it's really just kind of like it's at this point it's just kind of like um a, a a puzzle game and to me that's more fun than just waves of creatures coming at you so there's four main levels you have voyage of the what was it voyage of despair which is on the titanic you have ix which is in ancient rome which i'm looking forward to playing that one eventually and then there's blood of the dead which is an alcatraz and classified is in the special edition and i don't know what that is at so it's a pretty cool little addition to what they've done in the past because before it was just pretty much killing floor it was call of duty ripping off killing floor but now they've added a new little twist to it that makes it much more interesting and a little bit more fun to play and because like you just you're you're looking for clues left and right. like one of the things they found was if you sh- if you show your door to certain places there's a uh, ghost skull that you can barely see and if you grab five of them it opens up the next area and i don't know how they found it it's this thing where they just were walking around staring at stuff through the door like oh what's this and they eventually found them all so it's just it's really weird it's really cool so that's called duties uh zombies um cool. i uh uh suggest if people are playing the game which a lot of 13 year olds are uh try that yeah so yeah what you got going on so i've also been playing games uh but i've been playing them with my other life partner my wife uh we've been playing uh, a specific board game called The Others uh, that has been around for a couple of years now. Uh, I think it, I think it came out in 2016. It was a Kickstarter game originally. It was by Simon, a uh, fairly popular board gaming uh, uh, publishing house. And uh, they're very, very well known for kind of throwing a lot of their big miniatures games up on Kickstarter and raking in the cash. Uh, so this one's designed by a guy named Eric Lang, who's a very, uh, very well-known prolific designer. Um, and there's art credits to quite a few people. But... Uh, I've had the game for a couple years now, um, and we just busted it out because it's ho- you know it's Halloween season, so we wanted to play. We've been trying to play like some horror games and whatnot. So uh, this particular game is a horror board game uh, for two to five players. It's miniatures based. There's lots of miniatures. Uh, it's one v all uh, with asymmetrical rules. What that means is is that one person has to play the sin player, uh, meaning that they they control one of the seven deadly sins. Uh, and the base game itself has sloth and pride that's that's in the core box. And then there's like little mini expansions that you can get for all the other seven if you want. Um, and so the, the basic idea is that one person is controlling all the sin based monsters. So if you pick pride, you have all sorts of different pride based monsters like you have, a, you know, different different strengths uh, and different types. And then everyone else plays uh, members of faith, which is the federal authority for the interdiction of trans dimensional horrors. Uh, so it's an initiative that's trying to protect the world's last remaining city that hasn't fallen into corruption and been overrun by the powers of evil. Uh, this game's set in the near future. It's kind of like a horror with a little bit of sci-fi-ish to it. Um, it's kind of story-driven, and it's 
when I say it's horror, I mean, a lot of the, the miniatures themselves are pretty crazy looking. There's tentacles and blood and teeth coming out of places that you don't normally find teeth, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it's also about, you know, hell coming up, basically the idea of hell opening up and it's descending upon the earth and it's taken over like all of the earth, except for this one final city that the players, uh, the heroes are trying to protect while the sin player is just controlling all the monsters to try to make it kind of difficult. Um, so it's, like I said, it's kind of story driven in a way. Uh, and when I say stories, it, it's not the most in depth. There's like really not a whole lot of ton of story elements, just like story cards or anything like that. But um, they call it stories because there's three different categories of scenarios. It's scenario driven. Um, so there's terror stories, there's corruption stories, and there's redemption stories. So when you start a game, you pick one of those. And then within those categories, there's a couple options. And then within those options, there's even more like map variability because there's a very modular board with a bunch of different tiles and streets and districts. Uh, and depending on which uh, scenario you pick, there's all sorts of objectives that that tell the, the hero players what they need to do in order to win the game. Um, and there's some slight branching, like there's usually like one or two branching decisions you can make as a, as a, as a collective group on the, on the hero side, whereas the sin player, they just need to kill a bunch of them. Like that's really what it boils down to. Um, so the sin player themselves, uh, which I was playing both today and last night when my wife busted it out, um, I've been playing the sin player and I've been playing, I think I played greed. Yeah, I played greed. Um, they have... Let's see. They have the sin itself. They have like the avatar of sin, which is like a really, really big, strong monster. Then they have a controller, which is like a humanoid uh, that kind of controls the crazy sin uh, monsters. And there's abominations, uh, which are kind of like the middle roll, ro road, fo uh, like foot soldier types. And then there's acolytes, which I think is hilarious. And honestly, uh, when I was looking at this on Kickstarter way back in the day, th this is why I started backing it. So um, acolytes are corrupted humans. And there's all sorts of different kinds. So there's like corrupted hobos. There's corrupted nuns. The there's best kind. I know. When I saw corrupted hobos and I saw the painted versions, like they're holding like the end is nigh type signs. I was just like, I'm, I'm back in this. This is too good. There's cor corrupted doctors. There's corrupted cops and chefs and diplomats and firefighters um, that you can get from the Kickstarter as well. Um, and so they, they're basically, they just look like normal folks. They, so they just look like, you know, priests and nuns and, and then they have tentacles and stuff coming out of them because they've been corrupt. Um, so at the start of the game, the, the person who's playing this in gets the, you know, they pick or they randomize. I like to randomize. They, they pick, uh, like their sin, like what are they doing? And then that determines like which types of monsters they are getting in terms of abominations, which avatar they're getting and what controller they're getting. And each sin has like a, a small, um, they have like their own different power. Like for instance, I was just playing greed. And so greed allowed me to basically get extra dice when I was in a fight, whenever I was playing against, uh, whenever I was fighting against a hero that had a lot of like upgrade cards and stuff like that. Cause the idea of being greed is like, you get more and more equipment for yourself. So I get stronger by you getting stronger or something like that. Um, and then I randomize like what the alkalite is too. But again, some people just pick them. Some people randomize it, do whatever, whatever you want. Um, the players have a whole bunch of different heroes to choose from, and they essentially move around the city using one of the, I think there's four, I want to say there's four categories. There's leaders, there's fixers, there's bruisers, and there's snipers. Um, bruisers are melee folks, snipers, you know, are ranged, obviously. Um, fixers are kind of supporty, and then leaders also kind of supporty, but they can do a little bit of everything. They're pretty strong. Um, and no matter how many people are playing in the game, so whether it's a 1v1 like it was for, with my, my wife, or whether it's like a 1v4, if you get all the way up to five players, there's seven heroes uh, on your squad at the start of the game. So you have seven. So even if you only have three or four, you know, if you have three people playing, you're still going to have seven. Um, but depending on your, your player count, you only can have three or four active at once. So my wife and I are playing 1v1, so we, she can only have three of her heroes active at one singular time. Um, and so what happens is, is that as the game progresses, heroes are going to die. Like there's, it's a foregone conclusion. It's going to happen. And it's so cool sometimes when you do these like crazy, like suicide missions, like I'm just going to run into this building. I'm going to blow this crap up. I know I'm going to die, but I'm going to do it anyway. And it makes for some really kind of fun, almost emergent narratives uh, in a way. And then once one hero goes down, you actually bring another from the squad to reinforce, like you bring in your reserves. And so it's really, really fun. And and one of the, the way that the, the Sin player actually wins is that they have to keep killing and killing until the point where 
they've killed so many heroes that when one dies and then you you go to like the hero players go to look for who they have in reinforcements and they're like oh crap we have no reinforcements left that's when the sin player wins when there's no reinforcements left once somebody else dies um so on a player's turn because there's the, the games in rounds and the players can do a couple different things. They can move around, um, but they can also pick fights with monsters. They can put out fires because there's fires all over the place. And sometimes certain, um, you know, certain, certain cards that the sin player has, because every sin has its own special like deck of cards with special abilities and things like that in them. Um, but sometimes you can like add corruption tiles or you can add fires. So like, Corruption is a, is a particular mechanic and fire just does damage. And so players, they move around the city, they fight monsters, they put out fires, they try to clear corruption, they try to clear up pentagrams, like so, which are like these little tokens that you put on the board, which uh, essentially makes it a little bit harder to fight a monster if you're fighting them on a space that has a pentagram because they're a little bit stronger. Um, there's also special abilities for the players themselves. It, it, all the heroes have their own certain things. And then the district tiles uh, also have like each of these modular tiles and we have tons of tiles, holy crap. Um, they all have like their own special abilities. Uh, so districts can do things like heal, like you can heal your corruption, you can heal health, uh, you can gain items, uh, you can gain extra turns, or you can call in an orbital strike uh, to take out an abomination that's running around in the city, which is pretty fun. Um, so fighting monsters and clearing up corruption and fire and pentagrams all takes dice rolling. So this is a very heavily dice chucking game, um, but it's also a game that I think there's some really interesting choices and interesting strategies. So I know a lot, sometimes people complain with dice. It's like so random. And yeah, there's random to it, but like I do think there's good choices. Um, both the Sin player and the heroes, they have their own specialty dice. They all look completely different. They're D6s, but they're specialty. And the game has exploding dice. And so I'm not, I don't know if you know what exploding dice are, but... Um, basically exploding dice is that if you roll it and it lands on a certain you know on a certain side you can roll again right and so if i'm rolling the dice as a sin player and i get an exploding fist if that's what shows up after i roll i get to keep the fist as a hit and then i can roll another die on top of it and so i can keep chaining and chaining and chaining and then the hero players have something very similar um it's where they, they have like kind of a wild that they can pick to whatever they want and they can roll extra so it's really really fun um, so heroes have usually about five health. I can't, I don't know if like there's different heroes that might have more or less, but I think they all have five health and they also have this corruption track, which is really interesting. Um, if they run out of health, they die. And if they fill up their cor corruption track, bad things can really start to happen. But what's really interesting is that players can actually voluntarily take corruption at the start of the fight. Cause along the track, there are different spots that give you bonuses. These bonuses could be extra defense, could be extra attack. It could be extra dice um, or sometimes all of these things. Right. Um, and so if you voluntarily take some, then you might be stronger at the start of a fight. But at the same time, there's that kind of balance of how much corruption do I take? Because if I fill up my track uh, uh, with corruption and then I keep taking corruption after that, I start taking damage. Um, so you have to be really careful about balancing it, specifically in the the, the objective that we were playing with because my my wife's uh, one of my wife's objectives was to get a certain amount of uh, certain amount of corruption on each of her players. And so you gotta be like, well, how much do I get and how much is too much? That type of thing. Um, so you get into these fights and like players can take corruption uh, and then and they can use their items and then sins can actually play cards as well to like add dice rolls or re-roll dice or you know stuff like that. Um, and you just roll a ton of dice and sometimes it explodes and you keep going and then you figure things out. Um, like when I attack or when she attacks one of my monsters, like I can do damage, physical damage, or I can do corruption to them. That's what's on the dice. Um, she can you know, block damage, you can block corruption, and she can do other things as well. Uh, some of the item cards are really fun, and uh, some of them are really weird. Like, there's some crazy weapons, like both like swords and guns and stuff like that. It's a lot of mix of things. Some of them are passive stats. Some of them uh, are like extra range, extra damage, etc. Um, so every round, each hero gets two turn tokens. This is another kind of interesting thing about the game. So there's a round, and normally when you play a game, everyone gets a turn. You just kind of go around, you know, in clockwise, counterclockwise order, whatever it might be, and everyone takes their turn. So in this game, each hero gets two tokens, um, and that's their turn. And then, like, when they take a turn, they fl they flip it over to, like, the, the gray side, and then they go and we cycle around to all the different heroes. Um, but they also have the opportunity, in some cases, to gain extra turn tokens. Some, some heroes have that special ability. Some locations on the board might give you an extra turn token, which is really nice. And so just like normal, the heroes rotate who goes. Like they go, you know, 
hero one goes and then hero two goes and then hero three goes and then back to hero one and then back to hero two and then back to hero three until they're out of turn tokens. Now, what's really interesting is that the sin player doesn't actually get a turn. Like they don't get the go. They, they, they don't get the go in that cycle. Instead, the sin player gets reaction tokens and they start the game usually with three reaction tokens. Um, and they also have the opportunity to gain more reaction token as the, as the game unfolds. And so the sin player doesn't actually take their turn. Instead, like at least not in the traditional sense. Instead, they choose at any point they want after a, a hero goes to react to that hero. And they can choose to go at that point. And usually that involves moving a monster and like picking a fight with the active hero, the hero that just finished their turn. And at the start of the game, like if you think about it, like all the heroes, like my wife had three heroes, they all had, you know, two turns. And I'm the sin and I have three turns. So I have to pick, I have to think really, really carefully about when do I use them? When do I pick the fight? When can I trigger an ambush or something like that? Um, so I really like that. It's kind of strange at first. It, gets, it takes a little getting used to. And sometimes in the game, you, as the sin player, you kind of feel like, man, they have way more actions than me. But at the same time, I've been on the other side too and been like, I don't know, I don't know how the sin player is doing this. And so it's got that weird balance of it always feels like the other side is like OP and hard to beat. And I think that's actually a good thing. But I really like the idea of having to make that choice. Like I, I think board games are awesome when you have to make choices, like when the games force you to make really difficult choices and you can sometimes get good benefits or bad consequences based upon, you know, good or bad choices. So it's really, really nice. Um, so, and, and then during the course of the game, there's also this apocalypse track as well, uh, which sort of accelerates some things and strengthens the sin, the sin player over time, um, giving them the opportunity to spawn more monsters each round, giving them an opportunity um, to recruit specialty monsters. Um, so there's like this mayor who's possessed, who you can get sometime. Um, there's uh, this woman called Marguerite, who's like a, like, she's like a... I don't know exactly what how I would call it, but she can like wander around and move like in conjunction with other monsters. Then there's these these little kind of small guys like Vex and Gord who hold hands like the miniatures adorable, uh, like adorable and creepy at the same time. They just hold hands and, and do things as well. So there's all sorts of special monsters as well. So as the play as play progresses, like the the heroes are completing objectives and they're trying to advance the story. And eventually, at a certain point in that story, the avatar of Sin will will show up and it's just like super powerful monster. And then if the heroes can complete all the objectives of the story before they lose too many of their reinforcements, then they win. Otherwise, the Sin player wins. Um, so I love this game. Uh, I was on on I was on edge about whether or not I should back it when it first came out because this was back in my early days before I uh, I, I didn't realize I had a problem. Uh, but uh, I mean now I I know very clearly I have a problem with uh, backing too many board games, but. This one I do not regret at all. I think it's an under the radar type game. And I think these 1v all games are sometimes a little hard to get to table because a lot of people like either com fully competitive games or fully cooperative games. And this is somewhere in between. Um, but it's a really, really good, good game. I think the the the, the miniatures are fantastic. Um, there's a lot of cool mechanisms and a lot of cool variability as well. Um, it's still it's, you can still get this game. It's 60 bucks on Amazon might be cheaper on like cool stuff or miniature market. And then the sin expansions themselves are like 15 to 20 bucks if you wanted to get any more. Um, but that's the others. It's a really, really good game. Next time you're out here, I would love to play it, show it, show it to you. I think you'd uh, you'd enjoy it as well. I think it's a pretty fun game. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's a really good game. Definitely check it out, especially if you like one of y'all, especially if you like miniatures and especially if you like hell, because uh, this, you yeah, know, this has something to do with it. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the last part. What? No, but... that's that's bad. Uh, how about sins? Do you, if you like sins, yes, that's me. Okay, that's, that's me. better. That's better. Okay, good, good. Speaking okay. of sin, uh, <laughs> okay, I uh, oh jeez, uh, I'm I'm following the Reddit's as I do, you know. Sure, and sure. Top it's the post front page Reddit, of the internet. Yeah, top post on Reddit is about a new anime that's out, and everyone's like, "What's so big about this?" goblin slayer anime everyone's talking about so i look into it a little bit and it's a brand new anime um you can get on i saw the first episode on crunchyroll even though they're both on youtube uh but don't say that uh and i watched the second episode on youtube uh but uh so goblin slayer is a new uh anime out uh i believe it's through funimation I'm trying to see here I do not know the answer to the question. I don't know the answer to that question either. Anyways, it basically start. It's basically the idea of you are uh, think of like old style fan of Final Fantasy or Secret of Mana, and you're in this little town, and in this town they have a quest, and you can gather your little group together and and, and go upon a quest 
to uh, help the community or become a better hero and gain experience points on stuff. So there's different classes. There's porcelain class, which is the lowest class. Then it goes, I think, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. I think that's what it was. So the idea is that as you work up in your hero class, you become a better hero and you do bigger, bigger things. And so this small little ragtag group of new adventurers decide they want to go on a little adventure to try and stop uh, these goblins that basically stole some girls from a local village and brought them back to their little hovel. So it's goblins, not a big deal. They decide to go to the uh, person in charge of dis of distributing out quests. And uh, along the way, a little girl who's a priestess, they haven't, they really haven't, there's no real names to anybody yet. Um, so the priestess uh, is kind of like your follow along character. She says that she'll join them. She's she's learned some uh, basic healing skills, so she'll help out. And she's only got three of them, but she'll help them out. And so you have like your normal little uh, like warrior type guy, but he's kind of just basic and has just a normal sword. You have a little wizard, and you have her. She's a priest, and then you have also I'm trying to think of the last one, oh, like a, a monk style woman as well. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like a like a hand to hand fighter. So they go into the mines and didn't pay attention to what was going on. Didn't realize they had passed a back end of uh, like a back entrance to the cave. And in the process, you know, it, you know what happened is uh, they they have really low passive perception. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Or like if they were doing investigation tra uh, checks for traps, they they they, they seriously they rolled real low. I'm just throwing, I'm just making this a D and D thing now. Yeah, yeah, it's like a natural zero or something like that. Anyways, uh, they're called natural ones is as low as you can go. Nah, right. zeros. No, so, it's not. If it's natural, it's a one. That's as low as you can go. Well, uh, anyways, so uh, <laughs> okay. they are going through this and they get jumped on from behind. And during the scuffle, um, things go poorly, to say the least. Now, the reason this, this anime is getting such, uh, I guess, attention is because there is dismembering, there is um, sexual content. Uh, there's of, rape. I mean, just yeah. say it. There's implied rape. There, there's is, there's yeah. rape of goblin on kids, basically. Not kids, right. but these these these. Uh, I don't know what their ages are. Yeah, what yeah. their adventurers' ages are, but even still, like it's it's. There's it's goblin. Rape. I mean, and there's also like the assumption that the that the girl, like you would assume that the ones, the, the, that yeah, stole, the ones that they, they steal, the yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so. All the adventurers get horribly murdered or raped or dead or, or killed in just the most horrific yeah. ways. And like one's all... crazily poisoned. The one dude gets just like hacked to bits and yeah. then they and eat then... him. The other one, other than steal... the priestess, of course. Other than the priestess, they steal yeah. the monk and they uh, do things. So yeah. while yeah. this is all happening, the priest is getting ready to, they're ready to attack the priest as well. Then out of nowhere, the goblin slayer shows up and, uh, basically eradicates the entire little hovel um yep. including and, the baby goblins too because yes, they found baby goblins because his argument okay. is they will have a blood debt to kill him as they get older so and honestly the logic i think is sound just, yes yeah. sure and one could assume those baby goblins were created through the stealing of the girls in the villages maybe right? but he did say something like he specifically said that the way goblins work if we under if, if we believe that his his assessment of goblin physiology in this universe is accurate he did say that that they have a tendency to learn from what the earlier iterations of this tribe uh the mistakes that they made and they're just going to improve so by that logic like i see why he would just go around and slaughtering them all of course. yeah so yeah so that was the first episode they survive and get out and she decides at the end of the episode she's going to travel with him and try and eradicate zo or, or zombies, not zombies, goblins with sure. him on this quest. Sure. Did you watch the second episode? I did not. I only watched the first because you mentioned it, uh, and it was like you, you were the way you talked about. It, I had I hadn't heard about it because I don't. I guess I don't subscribe to the to the Reddit subreddits that you do. Uh, but uh, but you mentioned it, so I went and looked at it. Uh, and yeah, I mean like. I did a little bit more reading. Uh, apparently the, the manga is like way uh, worse. Way worse. <laughs> yeah. And that the way in which the, the actual um, events were, were depicted in the anime was mild by comparison. Like, 
like it's more implied like the like the, the rape is more implied based upon like the camera doesn't show it it's, it's almost more, borderline yeah. hentai if you ask me it's it's, it's you're getting i that. wouldn't go that far i mean hentai gets pretty crazy not that sure. i know anything about hentai. Yeah, but, who knows I mean, I mean from a yeah uh gotta edit that out. gotta edit that out i i couldn't tell if it was good or not so i watched the second episode and so it's right. on youtube and the second episode you kind of get more of a backstory of him he goes to his the place where he lives and there's a there's a woman there called cowgirl it's just this girl that he grew up with now here's the next part where i'm like is this good or not because she's very buxom and she's naked a lot now she's it's, naturally it's, it's just like in the first episode where they don't show anything but there's plenty seen you know so it's just like right is this just a uh, neck beard uh, material or is this good i couldn't tell Okay. And so they kind of get to the point of like when he was a child, goblins raided his home, killed his family and uh, raped his sister and mother in front of him while he was hiding in silence. And uh, he spends his days trying to eviscerate them from this planet because of what they did to him. And so he he does that. And it was the, the follow on character in that episode was cowgirl because it's about her. She's friends with him. And she grew up with him and basically how does he do the stuff that he does? You know, they go to the, they go back to the quest pub and everyone wants all these high level quests. He just waits till the end because nobody wants goblins. And so when everyone clears out, he then goes up and says, I'll take whatever goblin stuff you get. And then he goes and does it and they kill some more goblins. It's really interesting what they do, but like, I don't know yet if it's good or not, or if it's just so shocking for shocking sake. You know what I mean? Right. I'll say this. I mean, like my my first impression of this. Okay, let me tell you. Uh, let me tell you the first anime my wife told me about because I I was never a huge was anime. Berserk. It was Berserk. It was Berserk. <laughs> Which, you know, um, I watched it. And my wife's like, "Yeah, I really like Berserk." I'm like, "Okay, I mean, I'll watch it. Sure, whatever. That's fine." And then we watched it. I'm like, "Oh, my my wife's psychotic." Um, but <laughs> who would have thought? You know. But that's okay. I don't. I'm not judging. I'm just making a generic observation. Um. But I mean, I, I, I'm not opposed to like extremely dark storylines like this. I'm not opposed to them. I'm just it, it, to me, it's just how you handle it. You know, like, are you doing it? Are you presenting it in such a way that's really trying to like raise like like questions about the way in which we kind of glorify these types of uh, uh, of fantasy stories and how we have a tendency to make things a lot nicer and we we look away um, and we're like, oh, you know, it's they're just goblins and stuff like that. But like I'm okay with that, but I also feel like the problem with the problem I have with these types of things, like you've already mentioned it, like like to me the artistic style and like what they focus on, like always to me, just like I understand that that that's the style, and there's people who like it and stuff like that. But for me, I've I've always found that it, it's sort of there's objectification and it's just sort of I don't know, it's just it's just yeah, it's it's, it's, it's not it's very tasteful bad. and like. Like to me, like if you're going to explore those those darker themes, I'm all for it. Like, let's do it. Like, let's 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 do that in a really serious way and let's handle it. But like, I don't know. I just it didn't feel for like, me, it was it's being like you can't have you can't have both in this. You can't like make a statement on that and then also have look at this girl's boobs. They're great, right? You know, so it's just like yeah, I don't know. And I don't know. I, I only watched the first half an hour. So I like I or 20 minutes, whatever however long the first episode is. So I'm I am not like the authority on this. Uh, I'll in, keep in, trying in, it out. I'll see what's at. Yeah. Um, like currently right now one of my favorite man uh not mangas uh animes is One Punch Man and it's so the opposite of this. Yeah, and I I've love One Punch that. Man. It's so good. Um so anyways, I like, like fantasy stuff. So the like the general premise of this is a bunch of like these naive, ignorant little, you know, idiots who are going to go do something. And then they realize so quickly they're in over their head and they have to suffer the serious consequences. Like if you just explain it to me like that, I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds great, actually. But like it's the question of whether or not the manner in which it was presented is presented in such a way that I feel like does that that concept that theme or that that storyline just you know, real know. bad with it with his friend uh because there's just certain moments where it's just like this is just you're just trying to create stills to get neck beards all excited and okay. it's like and that was the only thing like in all the animes of i was like that's this isn't what i'm looking for i want a good story 
I don't need all that extra stuff. You know? Sure. It's, it's so blatant. And I'm just sure. like, okay. okay. Yeah. Anyways, that's Goblin Slayer. You can find it on Crunchyroll. Uh, the first episode is free on Crunchyroll for a preview. And then if you really want to watch all of them, they're on YouTube. So uh, there's that too. Anyways, uh, Goblin Slayer. All right. So speaking of good stories, you say you want a good stories. Uh, yeah. Quick, quick palate cleanser before we do our breakdown. Uh, Gideon speaking Fall. Of- of palate cleanser. Oh, sorry. I thought we were still doing this. you just you just ruined it. It was such Not a bad. beautiful transition, which we've been we've been we've been crushing tonight. I know. Go ahead. Blue. What's your stupid palate cleanser thing? Go ahead. Do your, no, do your I just thing. I was just noticing no, because I'm saying saying because I'm saying speaking of hey, it's getting false. Gideon false. Oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> I hate you. Uh Gideon Falls number seven is out. Uh it came out sometime, was it October 17th? So just a couple days ago. Uh, so I saw it on my Comixology uh subscription. Uh, I'm very excited to see it. I've been waiting. Uh it's been the longest wait uh between uh, number six and number seven. So it's nice to see it coming back. I'm not gonna go into it too heavy because I've talked about it on multiple episodes before, but I'm gonna check in every month or so because I love this thing. Uh, the fact that I'm paying a subscription. And I'm actually following this is ridiculous. Like, uh, but uh, again, Gideon Falls is written by Jeff Lemire. It's got art by Andrea Sorrentino and is published by Image Comics. Uh, the, the premise is that it's about a town or city called Gideon Falls. And specifically, it follows two POV characters. One of them is Father Fred, um, who has been called or assigned to the small town of, of uh, Gideon Falls to take over for where their previous uh, the previous priest had passed away. Uh, and when he gets there, stuff happens. A woman gets murdered. Um, one dude goes crazy. And then there's this mystical, strange, creepy barn that shows up that some people in town uh, think is a harbinger of evil of some kind. Like There's something evil about it. Um, and the, the sheriff actually sees it. Um, then the other storyline, it follows Norton, who is kind of um obsessive compulsive kind of guy wandering around a, a city whose name we don't know, but you learn the name and number six, but I'm not going to spoil it in case people haven't read six yet. Cause I think that's a fun little reveal uh, about what city it actually is. Um, but he's the other, he's the other one. He's a kind of a mental patient and his, uh, his psychologist or psychiatrist uh, moves along, is like kind of the other, like the buddy cop part. And he's wandering around this, this very big metropolitan city picking up, small splinters of wood and pieces of wood that we learn are basically parts of this barn. And he, he, he's trying to figure out exactly why. And he, again, he's got this little OCD, a little, little crazy to him. Um, but it's all sort of driven by this connection he's had to the barn over his life. And that's why he's kind of, kind of crazy, kind of in this weird, weird portion. So, uh, number seven rolls around. I'll say this number six needs to be read and I hate, I don't want to spoil it yet. I mean, I'm probably going to spoil it next month. So if you haven't read it by then you've gotten to like two, three months. So you've had time. Um, but number six has some pretty big reveals, um, but also some cliffhangers. And I thought it was really, really good. One through six was so good. Um, and some of the reveals had to do with the, the relationship or the nature of how these two seemingly disconnected narratives, these, these POV narratives between Norton and father Fred's positions uh, actually are interconnected. Like what's, what's the connection? What's the relation to them? Which is really, really nice um, with father Fred and uh, uh, in, in his storyline, he kind of befriended the sheriff uh, Clara, I believe is her name. And the two of them in, in number six go inside the barn, which is bonkers. Like crazy stuff happens. Um, and then she nearly gets killed. I won't say how, but like, but number seven sees the two of them sort of recuperating, having gotten out of it and like their memory starting to fade about what actually happened. Um, the sheriff has like, she, she's, uh, she, I think she became what motivated her to become sheriff was that her brother went missing when she was younger. Um, and so number seven gives us some flashbacks. And so we learn a little bit about her brother more specifically. And she has like a eureka moment, um, because, uh, about, what might have befallen her, her brother and why he went missing, whether he was kidnapped or ran away or whatever. Um, so there's kind of a reveal connection that I think we kind of already could have presumed, but it's a little bit more direct now. And so it's kind of verified, which is nice. Uh, Norton's I think is the even more interesting storyline in number seven, because there's this enigmatic character that we've seen pop up here and there. Uh, Dr. Zoo uh, X U and he takes on a fairly bigger role and he's now we see at least through the way in which the paneling was done, uh, the role and how Dr. Zhu's uh, connection uh, to the evil barn, which is really, really nice. And it ends again on a freaking cliffhanger. And so I got to wait 
it's November 16th or something like that. I think for, great for number eight. Reading single issues. No, okay. this is just stupid. I don't like it. Jeff Lemire, Andrea Sorrentino, get your crap together. Write your stuff faster. Let's go, man. Like I'm going to die before this is over. What if I told sad. you it is commonplace for people to miss their monthly releases? Well, um, I don't want to record a threat. Uh, <laughs> might be used against me in a court of law, but Mr. Lemire, Mr. Sorrentino, that, you better not miss a release. <laughs> better not. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, Justin, the, uh, the the first issue, by the way, is, is free. You can actually get it right now. Uh, Gideon Falls number one, if you want to give it a try, uh, you can find it a couple different places online. Totally free, totally legit, totally legal. Uh, you kind of dive in. Hopefully, you'll uh, take a look at some point um, because I think it's really good. And, and it's hooked me. I've, I've been reading a bunch of other ones that haven't really hooked me because I did the uh, the Comixology Unlimited stuff. I'm trying to find other things I really like. There's a couple things here and there that are okay. Um, there's others that I just I didn't think they were good at all. Like I just read them. I'm like, this is I've got student writers in my classes that write more compelling like <laughs> stories than this. The art's awesome, but uh, some of the stories I think are, are pretty bad. But this one's fantastic. Gideon Falls, number seven, Jeff Lemire, Andre- Andrea Sorrentino, Image Comics. Uh, get on Comixology now for three ninety nine for number seven. And I think they're collecting one through six, by the way. So I think one through six might be co- yeah, collecting. Yeah, that comes out. I'll probably, I'll probably get uh, that thing. So you can, uh, you can take a look. But anyway, that's it. Let's end on a happy note uh, with Gideon Falls and Crazy Evil Barnes. Uh, and then we got a movie to break down, Justin. Let's go do it. It's the movie. Breakdown. Ow, 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 ow. Directed by David Gordon Green and starring Jamie Lee Curtis, Halloween once again returns to the legendary psycho killer known as Michael Myers. Uh, In the 2018 iteration, which is written by both Green and Danny McBride, uh, events take place 40 years after Myers is uh, his initial Halloween killing spree uh, that Curtis's Laurie Strode was able to escape. So a lot of the sequels that happened that didn't do quite well are kind of just sort of hand waving them. Um, All this time, this 40 years, Myers has been locked up in a state-run asylum in what his doctor, Dr. Sartain, uh, describes as a dormant state. Lori, meanwhile, has spent 40 years preparing herself and her daughter, Karen, who's played by Judy Greer, for Michael's inevitable escape, uh, to the point where she actually wishes or prays that he escapes because she wants to kill him. Uh, So the years have not been particularly kind to Lori, who has become somewhat estranged from her, her daughter and her daughter's family, Uh, save for her granddaughter, uh, Allison. Uh, But the movie itself kind of gets going, or at least the the inciting incident here, is that a pair of investigative podcasters begin stirring things up by interviewing both Michael and Lori, and they're suggesting, uh, along with the doctor himself, that some sort of confrontation between the two might be necessary, like the, the one is driving the other somehow. So As you might expect, Michael ends his dormant state at a certain point and starts stabbing and choking and bludgeoning folks left and right, um, because that's what a psycho psycho killer does. Um, One way or another, the suggested confrontation between Lori and Michael looms, as you would expect. Uh, But the question becomes whether or not the 40 years of preparation time Lori had is enough for what she's about to face. So as always, we're going to try not to spoil stuff uh, like which of the recognizable characters die, which live and so on. Uh, but if you want to go into Halloween fully unspoiled, it's best to skip ahead to the Gentleman's Challenge right now. Uh, so, Justin, what do you think of Halloween? Um, I'm not necessarily a, a spooks uh, a movie watcher, you know, especially in the theater. Sure, I know. This month has been very difficult for you, I know. Yeah. You're hanging but, in there. Uh, I, I liked it. Um, I don't think it's going to stand the test of time in the pantheon of uh of horror movies but it was an enjoyable movie what what exactly do you mean by that like uh expand, like you got expand. you got like your top tiers like the original halloween right and uh the thing and um a lot of other high level uh silence films. of the lambs you know for yeah, yeah, yeah. scary movies sure sure i feel like in a couple months i'm gonna forget about this movie that's how dead I end from 2003 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um that's kind of how <laughs> okay. i feel about this like it was entertaining and i don't feel like a waste of my money but i don't i don't think i'm gonna remember it much longer from now 
I would say that's about it for this. Um, Let me ask you a question, Justin, so we can set sort of a baseline, you know, kind of like the way when you're taking a lie detector test, people ask you some basic questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So did you watch the Scream series? Were you a Scream fan? Yes, I did. Okay. How about like the Friday the 13th movies? Did you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've seen them all. Okay. Um, now, I'm usually from the comfort of my home and the use of the ability to sure. look away. So. Right. Well, you, you can also turn your head while in the movie theater, just so you know. You can actually close your wait, eyes wait and turn your head. Wait a minute. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah, that's true. It's okay. it, it can actually happen. Because um, I was just curious, because this, I mean, like this Halloween is a horror movie, yes, but like even more specifically, it's a slasher film, right? It's like a yeah. subgenre within the horror film. It's not my favorite of the subgenres, like I prefer different types, uh, but like it is, you know, it is within that slasher. And I've, and I've always actually preferred Halloween to, to like Friday the 13th and to Nightmare on Elm Street. So like two common, um, common comparisons, because I felt like Jason eventually becomes kind of like a, a ridiculously supernatural kind of creature. And then yeah. Freddy with his dream. Like I've always really liked Halloween because he's just big and quiet and he's just killing people. And there was a little ounce of motivation that was sort of thrown in there in a way that wasn't just you know jason running around wanting to kill people who are you know having sex and stuff like that like there was a little more to it with like the weird uh stuff yeah, with his yeah. mom and everything going on so i was really like it. plus i'm a huge john carpenter fan as you know and like halloween the original halloween directed by john carpenter this one he ep'd he was a he was an executive producer on this so he was involved he wasn't you know didn't write it and he directed but i mean he was involved which was nice to see um so i was just curious because like is it the case of when you think about the pantheon of horror movies, I get it. But like, how about if we compare it to other types of slasher series? I mean, well, you, where would no, you put it? It's no 13 ghosts. Um, right. But, Matthew Lillard or Lillard. Yeah. yeah and, uh, and monk. Tony but, Shalhoub. <laughs> um, you think I didn't know man, I'm going to crush it. You know me movie game, man. I will win. Uh, that. Game. I was thinking more Shannon Elizabeth, but uh, she, yeah, I yeah. know you were because you're you're a creep. Yeah. You know. All right. So uh, what? I, I just don't know if I'll care about it ever again. You know what I mean? Like, okay. it's it was entertaining. I had a good time in the theater. And the other thing I noticed when I was there, there was an exorbitant number of children in my theater, and I, it concerned me as an adult. Okay. Like, like how young are we talking? Middle schoolish. But I get it. It's a horror film, and it's Halloween. And I get that. It's but also like, not that gory. Like uh, I don't, I don't know. If I, I mean, people get stabbed, and there's blood, sure. But like, I don't think it's. I don't like. I, I mean, there's a very like foot related game. part that was shocking to me. Um, which which part? Foot related part. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was shocking, but beyond that, it wasn't terribly gory oh you're talking um, about the curb stomp right you're talking about the curb yeah, stomp. Yeah, yeah 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 that was pretty cool but it was just like you're stepping on a pumpkin head it's all good. yeah 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 it's the same thing um that was probably the goriest part yeah you're right yeah but like the I, I thought the gore was good i thought the story was good i thought it was entertaining um i liked the little twists that they did like i really like the the whole like look away look back they're missing thing i i really like that mm. tongue-in-cheek moment of of that kind of like flipping it type of thing i like that a lot and yeah, that was so specifically like justin's talking about there's a scene i mean obviously we already like everyone knows this like Lori and michael are going to confront each other so during one of these confrontations now historically speaking whenever you look away from a michael myers or or friday you know or or from friday the 13th to jason or something like that like you look at them and then you look away for a second and you look back and they're like oh they're gone like especially if they're lying on the ground you think you killed them well the reverse happens in here it's quite funny it's quite funny. yeah and, many and, of us in the theater chuckled and i liked that um i liked and i got the feeling after that moment that the the specific flip was occurring you know and I liked that. I liked sure. that it was kind of a, a change from the normal. Um, but like the only thing I'd have to complain about with this whole movie is if they would have stuck with just the synth score from John Carpenter, you know what I mean? And not done yeah. any of that other music, you know, lowered the amount of ambient music they do with the whole <sighs> that all that big like startling stuff. I feel like it would have been a lot more effective because the parts that I thought were best with him, because what makes him really good as like a, a a creepy villain is he's just standing there watching, right? Yeah. 
when He's we quiet play, about it. yeah, yeah, when we play Dead by Daylight, sometimes it's the scariest part of when someone's playing as Mike Myers because one of the perks of being Mike Myers in Dead by Daylight is yeah. not even pursuing someone, just staring at him from afar. Right? That's a yeah. thing that's kind of the lore they kind of throw into it as well. Yeah. So there's moments in the film where you see him step out from something, and there's music that happens, and I feel like that might have been put in post, like when it was all said and done to maybe appeal more to the masses. But for me, I feel like it would have been really good if they didn't do that, if they didn't draw attention to those little things as much, you know? Like when he goes into the the gas station and you kind of see him in the background, that was good. I liked that. There's no music. Right. Oh, there's no I know. attention. And then especially, like especially especially in the garage part. Yeah. You, you see him oh, through the windows. So and that, I thought that I was like, this is nice. I like that. There was no no attention at all. But then there's the backyard scene with her friend, mm -hmm. the granddaughter's friend. With the lights? Kinda, yeah, where he kind of yeah. steps out. And when he steps out, they start music. It, I feel like that shouldn't have happened. It should have just been there, right? And then he just notices it. Because when you do stuff like that, you're, you're, you're specifically cueing the audience to elicit a reaction. I don't like that. I like the better idea of anxiety. And feeling like, oh, get out of there. Don't you see what we see type of stuff. And when they throw in like this extra ambient noise, it makes it forced. So that would be my only complaint about this movie. Is that I, I feel like if they just would have stuck with the synth score, when the synth score was happening, it would be really, really good. Because um, the stuff that I liked okay. was like when he just he can just wander into people's homes. Right. And that to me is scary. Because just think about it, like, how easy would it be for someone to just wander in your home if you're home and do the things that he was doing? So it's just like, yeah, that, especially that, if you don't lock your doors. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that was scary. So like when they add all the extra like big boom noise and all stuff, I just wasn't a huge fan of it. Anyways, what did you think? Uh, I have similar thoughts to you in the sense that I, I don't think this movie does anything particularly groundbreaking like it really sticks to the script or at least sticks to the formula pretty well i do think it's all really competent like i think it's a good movie i do i think especially if it's a you know if, if you're a, if you're a younger crowd and you didn't really you know if you're like a like a millennial or something like that or, or generation z person or whatever they're called um and you really never got into the slasher flicks like if if they're too old and dated now because you're like justin and you can't watch a movie that was made uh, prior to 1990 um, or if, yeah. you know, you didn't really get into the scream stuff cause you weren't a nineties kid. Um, and this was like your first real entry point into the, the slasher. Like, this is a great representation. Like this is absolutely fantastic. Like, like to me, it doesn't do anything special. Like if you're, if you're the type of person who like me, who watches like all of this crap, cause I, I have problems. Um, but, and I'll, I'll watch it by myself in the dark when my wife's not around too. I, I don't care. Uh, but it doesn't really do much more than that. Like it just really just sort of the does, does the same thing. Now I'll give it credit for one thing. Like one of the things I really liked about the movie is that it kind of addressed to some degree, like kind of slightly like the, po the like the, like the, the consequences, right. Of, of being a survivor, which I think the screen did as well. Also um, with how I can't remember the lead character, Sydney with how Sydney ends up living by herself in the middle of nowhere. And she has like, super crazy paranoia and she works with and she works for like a uh, like a help a helpline and stuff like that the the idea that this this person uh lori she has survived 40 years on this and she remembers and like the the five or so people that were killed and, and like the initial night that that she was that she had to you know go through and now she's she's sticking with it. like to me that's interesting and how she's not had a great life you know and like she's had a rough life and she's she's made some choices and she doesn't regret those choices but at the same time you know and and i guess you can say she's justified for the choices that she made in terms of how she raised her kid and 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 how she got super paranoid and prepped everything and stuff like that but it's still interesting that at least they addressed it which is kind of cool um but the movie is very much emblematic of the genre it doesn't break the mold it doesn't kind of turn us on a head it doesn't sort of comment on it or joke around with it the way like a cabin in the woods did or something like that so it's pretty much a straightforward uh excellent entry i thought it was very very good 
I do agree in the sense like, will I remember this? Like, will I think back like, oh, this is like one of the greatest horror movies of all time? No, of course not. And I think like for something to happen like that, I think for for our, a horror movie to really do that, it needs to do something new. It needs to it it doesn't just repeat what's already happened, but it needs to evolve the genre, do something different, uh, because we've seen so much of it before. So. Um, but as you know, just as a starting point, like I don't know if they plan to do more of these. Uh, I, I know I don't know how I feel about that. Like because the last time they started to do sequels, they really got lesser and lesser in quality. Um, but it's, it was solid. Um, there are a couple of things I really liked from it. Uh, I mean, I really love the scenes with the babysitter and the kid. Those were really funny. Oh, that kid's um, the best part. That of kid's it. the best. Oh my god, and she was awesome. Can too. we get like, a movie oh, of just okay. him? I don't yeah. want it doesn't even have a script. Just I just want to have talk. the prequel to Halloween uh, where it's, it's just, just her babysitting. Yeah, they're just yeah. they're just chilling because they're hilarious together. Like so good. So it was funny. So cute. Yeah, it was so cute um, and, you know, kind of creepy, but also, you know, awesome. Um, and then I feel like Judy Greer's character had a really good line towards the end as well, like during the major like the uh, kind of the major final arc or final act of the movie. So she had a really funny line as well. I do think though it's it still ends up being in having the same stupid decisions, which is like they say like we're prepped and we're prepped and we're prepped and we're prepped, and then when it finally comes, they like they do the same stupid things and they you know and and they you know they don't cut his head off like yeah you know, I mean that's that's what you got to do you just got to cut you know you cut their head off right that's didn't they do that in Halloween two thousand I don't know maybe anyways uh, was there a post credit uh sorta it was not visual just audio so okay. Yeah. I'll have to ask about it one more. Uh, spoiler one more. alert. Okay. It was just him breathing. Oh, okay. So there you go. Which you might interpret as, oh, he survived, or it's just them having fun. You know, whatever. Who knows? Uh, so, uh, but I mean, overall, I think it's a, I think it's a good solid movie. I think it's worth seeing. I think you know, uh, right now, go see it. Like I would go see this in the movies. I, I would see that. I would recommend seeing it's this a in good, the theaters. It's a good during Halloween movie. Yeah. Absolutely. It's 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 in the title. So like if you're going to watch it, if you're going to go see it in the movie, go see it now. You know, go see it this weekend, go see it Halloween, you know, the weekend before Halloween. You know, when you know, if you want to wait for it, wait for it. It's still a good movie. It's still going to be a good hour and a half or so. It doesn't outstay its welcome at all. Um it, it's not too long and it, the pace is pretty good and you know, it's it's good. It's good it's a good movie. Good solid. And then movie. when you're done, go watch The Haunting of Hill House and watch a superior thing. Because right. it might be one of my favorite shows of all time right now. So yeah, <laughs> Justin, Justin and I both finished it and and yeah, we we love it. We love so, it. As as it probably could have been read into last week. All right, that's it. Let's go uh let's go challenge each other in a gentlemanly way. Yeah. And now it's time for the gentleman's challenge. So the Gentleman's Challenge is a segment we do on the Lolly Guys podcast where Justin and I like to give each other a homework assignment to complete before the next podcast episode. Now, this homework assignment tends to be like watch a movie, watch a couple episodes of a TV show, maybe play a game. We do so sometimes because we want to give each other something that's going to drive the other crazy and maybe generate some interesting conversation. And sometimes we just like to expose the other to something pretty cool that we might be missing. And then to ensure that we did our homework, come back on the next episode and we quiz each other about it. Uh, this is also a very spoiler-heavy zone, uh, so if you hear something that you want to watch or play that we're about to talk about and you don't want to be spoiled, probably best not to listen to it because uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it all with uh, with no regard for spoilers. Uh, so, Justin, I think you're up this week. I think you're gonna you're starting us off, right? Yeah, yeah, all yeah, right. yeah. So, Justin, what were you tasked with doing this week? I had to watch a 2003 classic, Dead End. Okay, I don't like your tone. Like right off the bat, I gotta say, I feel like your tone classic. Is, is unnecessary. Classic. It's unne- I never said it was a classic. I never said it was a classic. It was under the radar, good movie. Under the radar, good movie. Solid. But you probably right, haven't seen so, before. All right, go ahead. Directed by Jean Baptiste uh, Andre and Fabrice Canip Canapia. Can- oh God, <laughs> Canapa. <laughs> we should we should do a segment where it's just you pronouncing. Just trying to read people's names. It's just you trying to read names. All right, so this thing stars Ray Wise, Lynn Shay, uh, Mick Kane, Alexander Holden. Um, While you're doing this, I'm going to go practice the names for the two that yeah, I have yeah, to yeah, do, because yeah. those are really hard as well. So I'm AFK. So basically on Christmas Eve, on their way to their to their in-laws, um, a family, uh, including Frank Harrington, decides to try a shortcut for the first time in 20 years, and it turns out to be the biggest mistake of their lives. 
So basically, they usually go to their grandmother's for Christmas Eve, and uh, they always take the interstate. But this time, Frank decides to take a back road, and the back road's all spooky and scary. And along the way, they basically see a woman in the middle of the road holding a baby. And when they go to pick her up, uh, they want to take her back to us. They found a little like a, a ranger station that will look like a little shack. They thought, well, maybe there's a phone over there we can get in contact with. And so the first bad decision happens where they decide, OK, we'll put her in the car and have our, I guess, 20 something year old daughter yes. walk back alone. Yeah, to this maybe about a mile. Listen, down the road. they did try to get the son to be gentlemanly. Sorry, I should have mentioned. But the he said no. She has a little brother who actually might be older because it looks like he's thirty years old. You mean uh, Christian Bale? Yeah, he looks like Christian Bale, right? Like, like he kind of looks like he kind of looks like so, a dopier Christian Bale. He looks like a thirty-year-old is what he looks like, and. uh it was so distracting. They supposed to be like 17 or something. But anyways, uh, they let, have her get out, not her boyfriend. And don't even have her boyfriend walk her down the street with her. They're like, have her go by herself, walk down the street, and then they drive this woman with their baby back to the shed. When they do so, the shed is like got a bunch of traps in it and stuff, a bunch of furs in the walls. And then the woman reveals to the boyfriend her baby, and it's dead. And so uh, the boy, the boyfriend, like, dies somehow kind of and then this black car uh comes down the street and he's in the back of it and his girlfriend the girlfriend sees it and uh she notices that he's back there and they're like oh he's dead and then they drive down the road a little further they see his dead body on the ground and like they have to like inspect it and get his phone and when they pull the phone out the younger brother takes it and he had like a really douchey earring on and when he pulls it out he had a phone the phone had an antenna because it was in 2003 and on the antenna was the earring looped to it and his ear was just stuck on the phone. So it's all like gross and stuff. Um, I forgot to also mention when they stopped at this place, the little brother had gone into the woods to um, relieve himself and not in the urinary way. Yeah. Uh, through yeah. the other, through the other flap down there. He, um, he wanted to rub one out. Yeah, yeah. Apparently that's a good time to do it, but that's in the middle of the night. Uh, with the parents sure. like 20 feet away yep. let's jerk it next to a tree yep. anyways makes perfect <laughs> sense so uh next thing okay so i wrote down the events that happened okay so it goes uh young sorry, this is what i wrote youngest son looks 30 <laughs> driving to grandma's house for christmas mm -hmm. brad is killed uh then Richard is killed, which is the son. He goes off into the woods and he finds the same woman and she takes her clothes off and she's like a model or something. And uh, she kisses him. And when she kisses him, she like bites his lower jaw off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then uh, he dies and then they find his body. So Richard then dies. Um, whenever someone dies, they see him drive by in a black car. Uh Mom goes crazy from the youngest son uh, dying. She loses her mind. She reveals to everybody that it's not really Frank's kid. It was Alan. Was it Alan Rick? Al Al Rick? I don't know. We'll find out during the quiz. It sounded like so. Alan Rickman. That's what it sounded like. I think it was Alan. <laughs> Shoot Alan, 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 Rick. Alan Rick. Shoot. Because it's dull, you twit. It'll hurt more. So I'm uh, quoting Alan Rickman lines. That's that's what I'm doing. Mother cheated, and his name's not Richard. His name was supposed to be Mike. Um, so that happens. Mom then dies uh, because she jumps out of the car, and then she comes up, and she's talking to him. She's actually she's fine, but the whole back of her skull is opened up. And when she starts touching her brain, she starts having like a an orgasm, it seems, because she's thinking back to the time she was with Alan Rickman. Um I really hope it's Alan Rickman because man, that'd be really great. Too. It's not, but I really <laughs> hope it is. Alan Rickman. Uh, so basically, father goes nuts after she dies. Uh, he drinks too much and then goes a little batty. Um, the father dies because um, he goes in the woods and gets sliced by something. Um, daughter then has her uh, 
moment of what I did you let what uh, what I know what you did last summer where she's like, what are you waiting for? Come on, just do it. And uh, she then gets, I guess, killed. But then like she wakes up in a hospital and it turns out that when they were driving the car, uh, it uh, see the ensuing, the ensuing event beforehand was the father was falling asleep at the wheel. And when he fell asleep at the wheel, he almost crashed the car. And then after that moment, all the weird stuff started happening. So apparently what happened was that wreck did happen and everyone died except for her. And uh, she, this was all a terrible nightmare. And the guy that picked her up mm-hmm. was driving a black car, which was very similar to the black car that was picking people up. Very uh, similar? It, it or was. was it the same thing? And then during the part where her father was losing his mind, he wrote down a list of things he wanted to do before he died. And at the end of the movie, they find that list. So was it a dream or did it really happen? Um, so that's basically the movie. By, um, by Grapthar's hammer. What a savings. Yeah. It's an Alan Rickman line from Galaxy Quest. Just going to keep doing this. Go ahead. So um, this movie could not be more 2000s um the music is so 2000s the attitude the clothes everything is just so 2000s um ray wise is so 2000s which is so funny um in the end it was okay my wife was enthralled she's watching and she couldn't stop watching which was funny because she doesn't like horror movies but she was constantly glued to the tv watching this thing um to me it felt like a twilight zone episode that's what it felt like. Um, it's exactly exactly what I'm thinking, and it's exactly why I like it because I love Twilight Zone. Yeah, like but... it's not to me, it's not necessarily horror. It's just weird. Yeah, I mean, because and... there's really not a ton of gore. Like there's the biting yeah. of the face scene, but like all like what happens to the boyfriend and what happens to the to the you don't see anything. Like, you don't see it. You just see like little hands and the an ear. And that's I thought they weren't going to show the mother. It's, it's almost like a movie that they put on like USA Network or something like that. Yeah, it's just interesting because it felt more like a twilight zone episode so it was interesting but like it wasn't scary and it wasn't spooky um it was just weird because like when the mother loses her mind she like really goes nuts she's like a whole it's funny too i think it's funny a lot of funny lines it's got like a little horror comedy stuff going on yeah so it's just it's just a little strange it's clearly on a on a super tight budget because they're just on this one half mile strip of road the whole movie um yeah that has curbs did you notice that like it's the yeah. best thing in the nowhere and it's got curbs the whole way it's, it's interesting uh and they have like there's only like five actors and it's probably a shoestring budget but like it wasn't terrible it just it was a it was a twilight zone episode so like yeah. it was it I mean, was that's just, totally fair. Was interesting. Yeah. um so i didn't hate it i didn't love it either but there wasn't terrible acting um except the 30 year old younger brother he, he, he was awful to deal with. <laughs> he was just the worst. The mother. Yeah, it's a funny line. The mother, when she goes nuts, she's great. Um, yeah, she's really before. good. They also had the tendency, like whoever made this sure loved writing because they had all these monologues and all these like descriptors and, well, you didn't know that I had an affair and I knew that you had an affair. It's like very soap opery. And I don't know if it was just supposed to be tongue in cheek, but man, there's this. I thought it was sort of intentional, like tongue in cheeky. Cause I, I don't know. I, to me, this is like a, a, a horror comedy. You know, that's yeah. Cause the, every like 20 minutes, they uh, reveal the biggest reveal on planet earth. Like I want to divorce. I don't, I don't want to marry you. I, or I don't want to date you anymore. I want to marry her. I'm pregnant. I cheated on you. I cheated on you. I smoke weed. Like it's just thing after thing of these big reveals, which is just almost comical. And I don't know if it was meant to be that way, but it was just weird. I think it was, but like, it's just a strange movie. Um, I didn't hate it though. I didn't feel like I wasted my time watching it. It, it didn't go by slowly cool. and it and stayed on pace. And I, I, I thought it actually ended quite smoothly. Um, and I feel right. like uh, I've seen that guy before too. The guy who drives the black car. I don't know what yeah. I've seen him before. I think he played. He's he he's got that Ichabod Ichabod Crane look to him. You know, he's that guy. He's that. His guy. name's Steve Valentine. Oh gosh, that's in Spider Man uh, Three. There you he's go. He's got to be a killer. He's he's got to murder people. Yeah, yeah. With a name like that. So I probably saw him in Spider Man Three. 
All right, you so, ready for the quiz? You ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ready. All right. Okay. So five questions. Here you go. I feel pretty confident you're going to do that. Well. Right? I feel really great. I want you to do well. So why are they always late? What? Why are they always late? Um, they're always late. Wow. I don't yeah. even remember this. Yeah. Why are they always late? Um, because he's always wanting to experiment in different roads? Question mark? Like, literally within the first a minute and a half. Uh, because it's one thing or another. It's either somebody's missing their blue shoes or you can't find a Marilyn Bronson CD. Oh, Marilyn Bronson. <laughs> I, wow. I don't I didn't remember right that line bat. right off the bat. It was right there. It's like the I did not remember that line. first conversation they had. Wow. Okay. There's a lot of conversations in this movie, too. Okay. Second question is about turtlenecks. It's two parts. Okay. okay. First, how many turtlenecks were in this movie? Second, second. Turtlenecks. Yay or nay? There's three. And they are. Father, the daughter, and the boyfriend. That's incorrect. The boyfriend did what? not actually have a turtleneck. We'll have to we'll have to double check on that, but I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure it's just a dad and Marion. Oh, pretty I thought sure. the brother. I thought the, the I thought Brad. Brother had definitely doesn't. Mother definitely doesn't. I'm pretty sure. Turtleneck. Not. I'll have to say nay for me because I have fat head and uh, fat jowls. One might say, and all it does is just push it up. Like a tube, mm, and uh, kind of sure. like uh, like a lollipop. So I'm no on the turtleneck. So that's that's my okay. So the correct answer on that question is yes. If it's a black turtleneck, as Archer has explained this to oh, us, my, I'm so sorry. I forgot wrong with you. I'll I give you Archer. point two two five. I'll give you a quarter <laughs> credit because we're gonna have to knew... check the tapes for that third one. I, 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 well, 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 if we need to retroactively change this, we will. But I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Okay. All okay. right. All right. Justin, what is there to eat in the car? There was the pumpkin pie that had chocolate on it, and there was uh, potato chips. I'm sorry, that's that's an incomplete answer. There, the potato chips. That's correct. There was pumpkin and chocolate pie, but you forgot that it has a distinct smell of ass. Also, there are some boogers, and there's macaroni. Come come on, there's macaroni and dick cheese. Come on. Say one more time. There's macaroni and dick cheese. Come on. So I'm going to have to give you half credit. Half credit. Boogers and macaroni and dick cheese. He specifically said that you could eat it. <laughs> it was there and it was really funny. And this is supposed to be an entertaining podcast. And so, of course, the question would want you to have the entertaining answer. God dang it. You're so disappointed. Real, Point five. The real things for the Point pie five. and the chips. Five. Point five. You know these right. are you know these aren't real quiz. Like we're supposed to just be having fun. Is no, listen. I'm just saying that. You know, I'd like to have macaroni some. and dick cheese. There's a real <laughs> cheese. Dick cheese is real. The Chinese make it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, question number four: What did Frank do with Sally Schmidt? Uh, he reamed her real good in the hotel. Oh, that's incorrect. That's incorrect. He went to the Motel 6 and they humped each other raw during their lunch break. Uh, I gotta so, give it. That's half credit. I'll give you half credit. You just said it like a creep instead of saying it the funny way <laughs> that the movie did, but whatever. Final yeah. question. Final question. How does Richard handle a lug wrench? He uses it with his foot, which... No. Oh my god. He handles a lug wrench like a whore handles a baby. Come well, I don't even remember. Why that. am I even? Why are we even, even doing this podcast? I why are we even doing this podcast? Don't pay attention. You know, this is the funny lines. We're just going to get murdered because that's what happens with investigative podcasters, and we're a pair of podcasters. <laughs> God, I don't man. remember that. It's like one of the funniest lines of the whole movie. You handle that look like a whore him. handles a baby. Oh my God. I don't even remember that. Why? 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 Are we doing too many Sit, I'm leaving. I'm gone. I'm out of here. See ya. Yeah, that's not my budget. All right, so going through this, you got zero on the first question. You got 0.25 on the second. You got 0.5 on the third. You got 0.5 on the fourth, and you got zero on the fifth. So you got a 1.25. Say round it up to two. No, 
Dude. Well, one point two five rounds down to one, actually. So I'm a math teacher. I, trust me, it checks out. You're a geometry teacher. You play with blocks for a living. Like you That's just, true, but <laughs> just play with blocks. I'm so yeah, disappointed yeah. in you. So disappointed in you. I, I enjoyed the movie. I I ask questions about all the funny lines. Like every one of the funny lines. <sighs> oh there weren't there weren't even any trick questions or anything really. Oh man. All right, my turn. Gosh, right. man. Oh, I'm so mad right now at you. All right. I would be too. So, so Justin assigned to me Eramentari, the blacksmith and the devil, which was written and directed by Paul or Kiho Alijo. I hope I got that right. Alijo. And there's another and there's another writing credit, and I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. Asier Guerra Chivara. I, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I, I went confidently Sounds through right. it. Sounds I didn't right. stumble. I didn't stutter. And if I made a mistake, I just kept going. And who the hell's going to know? Because uh, it's not like they're going to listen to this podcast. Uh, so uh, this is a, a movie that's uh, it's up on Netflix. Um, it's based on a it's a Spanish film. Um, I think it's I'm not sure if it was like the co-producer uh, in both France and Spain. But I know a lot of the, the, the main players are Spanish. Um, but it's based on a European folktale about a smith who makes a pact with a devil and then finds a way to kind of weasel out of the pact. And that's sort of like the folktale itself. And there's different iterations of that. And the movie basically follows that same plot, right? So after the opening scene where we see a man escape somewhat magically from a kind of firing squad, uh, and then be sort of there's like a mist that shows up and like a little devil appears really briefly. And then this guy goes and starts killing his would-be executioners. The movie then flashes forward. So it's set eight years after the Carlist War in 1833. Um, these are Spanish Civil Wars. Uh, there's a tax collector, uh, or I, 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 I keep calling him tax collector. I don't know if he actually is a tax collector, but I'm going to call him that. Um, he's a government official of some kind. He arrives in a Spanish village. Um, I think the name, I looked it up. I think it's Alava. Um, he arrives in a Spanish village because the local blacksmith, Paxi, uh, apparently has some kind of hoard of gold uh, that the collector wants. And so the smith is kind of persona non grata in the village, probably in some part due to the fact that he built spiked walls around his forge, like literal metal spikes coming out of the doors and walls. And there's a sign that says in Spanish, basically, get, get the hell off my property. Uh, get off my lawn, that type of thing. Um, and there are rumors that he uh, killed his wife's lover after returning from war and that his wife killed himself, uh, killed herself, excuse me. Um, yeah. And so we know just from looking at this, the same guy from the very beginning who escaped the firing squad. Uh, the tax collector convinces some dumb guys, uh, and they are quite dumb, to help him get into the forge, which goes absolutely terribly as one of the guys accidentally dies when his head falls onto a bear trap. So, but, you know, stuff happens. Uh, meanwhile, there's another storyline kind of brewing, and there's an orphan girl named Asui uh, who likes to skip mass. Uh, she steals the mass wine at one point. Uh, she has a friend that's a snake, and then like these little jerks who pick on her kill the snake because uh, this one dude can has like has like Drew Brees pinpoint accuracy from a distance with throwing. Um, and so she has this little doll that reminds her of her mother because her mother died and likely is in hell or something like that. Uh, and so they rip the doll in half. And they throw the head part into the and like, over the fence or over the walls into the forge. So the one with all the spikes and whatnot. Um, so as you might expect, the uh, the girl sneaks into the forge, uh, just like the uh, the idiots who did. Uh, but she goes all the way inside, like not just like into the into the like behind the walls, but actually into his home. And she finds that the blacksmith is holding this dude in a cage. And the dude's like, hey, free me. And he and she's like, maybe. Um, so she sets him free. And whoops, it's a devil named Sartael. Uh, and like when I say devil, I mean like the classical kind of red with horns and like a forked tail and a pitchfork and stuff like that. Like that kind of look. Um, the devil tries to kill the blacksmith in his sleep, but fails. Um, in the process of this kind of hectic thing going on, the girl gets hurt. She hurts her ankle. Um, the the blacksmith gets, he, he recaptures the, the devil. Um, the town folk get all riled up because of this missing orphan girl that no one really seemed to like to begin with. Um, and so they get all riled up to go get her. So they kind of charge and storm his home while he's like repairing the girl's leg or ankle and like re, uh, uh, like 
like re-imprisoning the actual devil, Sartael, and then kind of giving her tips on all the different things that drive uh, a devil crazy. Um, and so they attack him. They bust into his forge. Uh, and, and, and like he was like leading her out and they like confront each other on the crossroads and then like they attack him. And then they in doing so, they like they bust into his home now with him being out and surrounded. Um, and so they're looking for this, quote, gold. Um, so this is all basically a front because the tax collector guy. And I thought this was kind of obvious in the beginning, but the tax collector guy uh, was actually this super powerful devil named Alistair. Uh, and he, uh, you can milk those. So anyway, stuff happens right. uh, where the Smith almost dies. Uh, the little girl makes a pact with Alistair. Uh, she agrees to give him her soul in exchange for him taking her to hell so that she can find her mom. Uh, the S Smith and Sartael make a deal. So the original devil, because Alistair, he demoted Sartael. Uh, and Saratel doesn't want to go back to hell because whatever position he got demoted to, he doesn't want to like go there for whatever reason. Um, and so he makes a deal with the Smith. And so he brings the Smith to hell to find the little girl. Um, and he rings a bell and he drops some chickpeas and everything works out fine. And even for Sartel who wanders off into the wilderness and then hops on a, a wagon and, and rides back. So a uh, little girl, she, she's saved by the guy, but they don't ever actually find the, the, the mother and then like the guy opens a door and goes through a door in hell and then you get like uh like yeah some cartoon stuff so yeah that's the movie um what did i think of it um it was okay uh i felt like it was kind of slow uh it took about 23 minutes 24 minutes into the movie before it really got going and i also felt like there was like a false ending to it and the ending sequence when they actually went to hell just made no sense because there's a point where the door started closing and everyone's like, no, don't leave us out. And they like running in the doors. I'm like, no, wait, that's hell. You're like, you're literally running into hell. Like run the other way. What the, what the hell's wrong with you people? Um, so that was kind of strange. Um, but it looks pretty good. Like it, like the, I think the production's really good. There are times when the devils kind of look kind of, kind of dopey. Like the tone of the movie is kind of weird because uh, at certain points it seems very like horror like or very serious and scary. But other times it's very comedic and like because especially when it comes to the devils like uh, like Sartail is like kind of goofy and silly. And like the fact that he just needs to obsessively count chickpeas is pretty funny. Um, so there are some funny moments to it. But it's also like really heavy and really dark and like a dude dies by getting his head caught in a freaking uh, uh, bear trap. So um, I've read that like the like the director or the people who created it, they wanted it to be kind of like a, a like a movie for kids that is like horror, kind of like the way that like cited this is for dark kids. Things. Well, he I read an interview where I, I think he cited uh, the fact that he wanted it kind of to be thought of the way that the that Dark Crystal is, which is Dark Crystal is one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm actually wearing a Dark Crystal shirt right now, strangely enough. Um, but in Dark Crystal is like old Jim Henson production and whatnot. Um, but to me, like this was like way creepier. And the fact that it was dealing with hell and damnation and like, I don't know, like, I think it's a little, I think that some of the imagery is a little too, uh, too much for that. But um, it's an interesting movie. It honestly disappointed me a little bit because I had a little bit higher hopes for it because I saw, um, I saw bits and pieces of it come up on Netflix and I was like, oh, that looks really good. And then you assigned me it. So I'm like, ah, oh, cool. This is, this is fine. Um, I don't think it's a bad movie. Uh, it's definitely not a movie that I think uh, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and make fun of it because I don't think it warrants that. I do think it's a pretty good production. It looks pretty cool at times and there's some really good moments, but overall I was kind of disappointed by it. I was hoping it was going to be better. I felt it was a little bit uneven. I felt like the beginning was a little slow and I felt the end uh, felt a little bit offbeat. Um, the middle parts were really good. And the first, our first introduction to the blacksmith, eight years later when they like when the first round of the people tried to break into his home and he busts out with this big old metal shield and like a freaking Jason like mask. It was awesome. Like that was like such a cool little sequence. Um, and yeah, I mean, some of the, you know, and some of the jokes were kind of funny here and there, but uh, overall it's kind, of a, it's kind of a weird movie that didn't quite ever, didn't quite ever hit with me. I, I, again, don't think it's a bad movie. Don't think it's a great movie. It's somewhere in between. It's, it's just, it, just misses the mark a little bit just just a little bit a little bit off so uh, that's aramentari blacksmith and the devil it's up on netflix uh what did you think of it uh i thought it looked good um like visually i thought it was really interesting till the end then the whole the hell whole stuff part. just got weird right like it just yeah it kind of ruined it whatever it ran was out of money yeah um i thought visually it was really interesting um i thought the overall story was good i thought i like the little girl stuff but 
in the end, like you said, like the end got real wiry and strange. So yeah, it got a little loopy at the end. Things didn't quite work out pretty particularly well. And yeah, but uh, yeah, beyond that, it wasn't it wasn't the worst. So, anyways, you ready for your quiz? I think so. Let's go. All right. What was the name of the little girl's doll and her rock? Oh God, man, I don't remember the names. This is the foreign language film. Uh, it's good enough that I actually got through the the director's name. Um, let me see. I'm trying to remember. I don't think I'm going to get this. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know at all. It was Matilda was her doll. Okay. And Napoleon was the rock. I do not remember Napoleon. When the snake huh. came, the whole thing. Yeah. I do not remember the Napoleon thing. Matilda sounds familiar, though. That, 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 Matilda that. died. Do you know why Matilda dies? Well, she, little... she got her head ripped off. Yeah, she had no head. Yeah. She can't yeah. eat. Yeah, can't eat. All right. Die what was the head. deal that was made to the blacksmith and the devil? Uh, that he could base that he can go home, that he can return to his wife. Um, and so, like, it was it was like that classic kind of Faustian, like, don't read between the lines type of thing. And so the devil let him return. Um, but it was a really long time. And then they thought he was, she thought he was dead. And so the wife kind of moved on and started seeing somebody else and had a kid with, but it was just basically, he was supposed to be able to return from the war. Like that's that he returned to his wife with, uh, from the war. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Oh, I just got a buzz right when that happened. I'm good again. All right. That was good. Good answer. Good answer. You get yourself a point for that one, my friend. Thank All you. Right, so next one. What? was the best demon out of all of them uh i like the really really fat one that had no neck uh i don't i don't like we didn't have any names for him but like at the end when they're trying to go through the gate there's all sorts of differences like some of them look kind of fish like mm-hmm. some of them look kind of like animal like there's one that looked like a dog but there's a really really fat one uh that had no neck and i love that one i was like that, oh that's my favorite that is a good one however it is a second place a strong second place to the ass face demon. Um, that's the best demon, where there was a demon whose ass was a face. So you're just I so you're just you're just like a juvenile. How do you not pick the ass face demon? That was pretty because good. It's it's silly. It was stupid. It makes no sense. I like the one that was big and fat and had a neck beard. You've been talking about neck beards this whole damn. Now episode. you're telling me that cat dog doesn't make sense. All right, mm-hmm. I'm What's... taking. I'm taking credit for that one. So that's when the two. dog What's eats, next? how does the how does it go to the bathroom? I'm taking credit for that. Stoop, stoop. Moving on. All next right. question. Uh, last one. Okay. Let's say you are a constable or uh, uh, the the head of a uh, uh, of a small town police station in like okay. southern England, right? Let's put yourself in that world. In um, England, it's, it's yeah, a and, place and, in Spain. It's a know. different country entirely. Yeah, I know. But let's just use this. Um, you're a constable or a commissioner in a small town in London, mm-hmm. and there might be collusion uh, here. You better call uh, Commissioner Gordon. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you're the head of it, uh, of the small town. And this town gets best town every year, right? Um, say you're that oh, guy. So it's hot fuzz. It's like hot fuzz. Okay, got say it. you're sure. that guy. How would you describe the look of the blacksmith? What do you mean the look of the blacksmith? With the way the blacksmith looks. Say you were the constable. How would you describe how the blacksmith looks? <laughs> I'm, re- I'm really leading you heavy into this. I I, I I feel like you want me to say something. but God, I, I really you. wanted you to. He, he's got a great big bushy beard. Perfect. Yes. Got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> great big bushy beard. A great big bushy beard. Right when I saw the guy, I'm like, that guy's got a big old yeah. bushy beard. He's got a, he does. And then, like, his hair was so good. His hair was so bad. Great big any, bushy beard. Any other questions? You're not going to ask me, like, what Sartiel was was demoted to? I thought for sure you were going to ask me that question. No, I didn't. I'm so ready for that. And I'm going to mention anyway because it's pretty funny. He was demoted to Fifth Circle, which is the sad and repressed section, Boiling Pot 203. Such a good line. Such a good line. <laughs> so good. All right, so you three got uh, I got three. Zero, one, two, three. Uh, I'll give you two and a half. 
I'll give you half credit. Okay, I'll take half credit. That's fair. Even so negative. Okay. All right. So that, that there you go. So I hope you enjoyed it. So there still, you go. Still better than me. Still better. Give, I, I even give is you that more ever questions. Change? It's episode 30. What do you, you I don't think know, it's man. ever going to change? I don't know. I don't know. Too many shots to the head. So. You ready for new challenges? Yeah. What do you got for me? So I was looking on Netflix, going through stuff, trying to find stuff. And then something I was reminded of something that's coming this weekend. And it is made by those who make your favorite show, Riverdale. Okay. So the CW? You're, you're good. It's not it's not CW. It's a Netflix oh. show. But okay. it's produced. And okay. I think it's also written by the same people who do Riverdale, right? Okay. So I'm thinking this guy, he's gonna have to love it. So starting October 26th on Netflix, you can find the new Sabrina TV show. And it comes out. Oh, I'm actually excited to try this. Oh, thank you. It I is a Riverdale this. production. So it's right up your alley, pal. It's so called Sabrina. it's it's I think it's just it's, I think it's called the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Yeah, yeah. Chilling Adventures yes. of Sabrina. As her 16th birthday nears, Sabrina must choose between the witch world of her family and the human world of her friends. There you go. I'm working on my what my what speaks voice. better towards you than 16 year old girl in turmoil, right? That's actually not true. I like Riverdale because it's stupid. Uh, I don't really have to think too hard, and there's always a mystery every season. Like every season, there's some sort of, like hey, there's a cult this time. There's a cult, man. There's like babies right. floating in the air above freaking bonfires and stuff. What's going on, man? And then there's like a gargoyle thing going on with like a role well, playing game. Be serious too. Ooh. Who knows? Ooh. Serious Can't and play. spooky. Well, according to Entertainment Weekly, it reimagines the origin and adventures of Sabrina the Teenage Witch as a dark coming of age story that traffics in horror, the occult, and of course, witchcraft. Totally in the vein of Rosemary's Baby and the Exorcist, this adaptation finds Sabrina Spellman wrestling to reconcile her dual nature, half witch, half mortal, while standing against the evil forces that threaten her, her family, in the daylight world humans inhabit. That sounds good. that sounds pretty that sounds pretty pretty good, man. Sounds, sounds pretty good. So yeah. I feel like uh, you were trying to give that to me to punish me, but uh, no, I was like, this guy loves Riverdale. I was gonna love this. True. All right, are you ready? Uh, I was born ready. So a couple weeks back, we watched a movie by a director by the name of Jeremy Saulnier, and uh, first time I ever watched a movie by him uh, was just a couple years ago, and you're gonna watch it now. It's a movie called Green Room, and it's with Captain Professor Xavier Picard. Oh, no. I know there's really awful things in this movie. This is this is the worst one you could give me. Found on Amazon. This will be the no. final, final of the scary movie month. It's a Blumhouse movie. I know what this is, and I've yeah, heard about baby. it, and I've avoided it because I've it's heard it gets so good. good. I heard it gets so pretty gross. So It's so good, dude. It's so oh, good. No. You're gonna love it. You're gonna love it, dude. I could have given you Mandy, and I didn't give you Mandy. I gave you. Yeah. Green Room. Get but over. you gave me a movie where Captain Picard's a white supremacist. What are you doing? I hey, you know, honestly, if you read it, you can read X Men as him being, you know, <laughs> that too, kind of in a way, sure. sort of. You know, there's a read there. All right, uh, we're gonna close this sucker down. Uh, if you would like to maybe give us some suggestions for uh, for a challenge or two here and there. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Lollygagger Co. You can also find us online, uh, lollygaggerco.com. Uh, you can uh, maybe send us an email, drop a line on the website, or, or shoot us a, shoot us a tweet. A tweet, I think that's what the kids are calling them. Uh, Justin also does some streaming. Uh, Justin, what is your Twitch channel? That's twitch.tv slash Uh I see some sweet wow stuff going on on the weekends. And I was going to do some uh, uh, COD stuff today, but then we had to go see the movie, so I didn't have time to start it up. So hit me up there anytime. Took took me a second. I realized that COD uh, was Call of Duty. I was like, what are you doing with fish? It's like, okay. yeah. what are you? That's okay. what the kids are calling it. Oh, is it? I thought it was COD, but that's fine. Uh, all right, let's do some thank yous. Let's thank some people. You ready to thank some people? I'm good. Oh, yeah. I want to thank Facebook Watch, whatever the hell that is, because I have no idea. 
Uh, I want to thank them because they're making a TV series starring Jessica Beale about one of my favorite fictional serial podcasts that I assigned to Justin about a month or two ago called Lime Town. I love the podcast. The second season's dropping really, really soon, so uh, check it out if you haven't already. Uh, but anyways, thank you, Facebook Watch, whatever you are. I'd like to thank the wonderful Florida weather where I set up an outdoor activity for my kids to do a coordinate plane on the sidewalk and it immediately started raining. So thank you so much, awesome. Florida weather. I want to thank the Los Angeles Dodgers for making it to the World Series again. Uh, I love this team all, all my whole life since I was a little boy collecting baseball cards. Uh, and so for the next week or so, I'm going to be super stress-filled and uh, anxiety-riddled uh, as they probably get their butts whipped by the Red Sox. Uh, but anyway, they made it to the World Series, and Justin's Cleveland Indians didn't, so that's awesome. I'm making fun of Native Americans. Way to go, buddy. Anyways, you? Uh, never mind. I'm not going to make that joke. I like to thank Volusia County Athletics um, because yesterday at our game, which we lost terribly, um, the opposing team, just one county over, had uh, – a cryogenics guy spraying their kids with cryo stuff to cool them off. Meanwhile, our headsets didn't even work. So, uh, nice. Thanks for the investments in the Volusia County Athletics. <laughs> this is really comparable to the other teams. It's really great. Thanks so much. 